So yes, so I'm going to talk about pharmacology um, a bit in general and obviously focusing on when we're choosing a, a, a combination today because a lot has changed over the past few years. Disclosures again, I think it's going to go bigger, but I can start talking. So, oh, perfect. Thank you very much. So um, what do we mean with pharmacological considerations? What are we actually going to talk about? So I'll cover drug-drug interactions and therapeutic index, genetic barrier, long-acting, and a bit of adverse events, because obviously drug side effects are an important pharmacological consideration. So, as I said, more than once this morning already, actually, antiretroviral drugs have improved remarkably over the years. They're much easier to use today. Their, uh, their safety uh, patterns are easier. Um, they're better toler uh, tolerated, they're uh, more potent, they're easier to take in the context of daily dosing. We even have injectables where you don't need to take the pills every day. Uh, the drug-drug interaction management has become easier and the genetic barrier has increased in the absence of the booster, which is a really important element that is in has increased how we manage people um, in clinic. So let's just focus on drug-drug interactions one second, because I think there is a very important general concept that we have to no. First of all, what we are used to, or we have been used to for a very long time, is to the antiretroviral drugs to be perpetrators of drug-drug interactions. So that is when we use ritonavir and cobicistat that inhibit cytokine P453A4 and lead to an increase of the co-medication that can become toxic. So that's the antiretrovirals that is the perpetrator of the interaction. Similarly, it happens for uh, a minority of drugs, but drugs like olanzepine, for example, that is uh, metabolized by cytokine p 451 a 2 and glucuronidation. And these metabolic pathways are induced by ritonavir. Again, you can see ritonavir is the perpetrator of the interaction, causing a change this time a decrease in the co-medication. And this is also seen with the favirins, a travirin, the virapin, older NNRTI that we are moving away from. So older antiretrovirals being perpetrators of interaction. As I said, we are moving away from all of that, which makes our life much easier because we are using drugs nowadays more frequently like raltegravir, doravirin, dolutegravir, bictegravir that are not or are rarely perpetrators of drug-drug interactions. So the co-medication is safe, is there, it's not going to change and it's going to work also very importantly. I remember in the older days, people coming to clinic on efavirenz and amlodipine for their hypertension. Amlodipine is a substrate of cytokine P453A4. Efavirenz induces, and they told me, my hypertension is not controlled by my treatment. Of course it's not, because the amlodipine is not working, because there's not enough there. So, you know, um, that's what we used to see. Now, today, as I said, we're using drugs that are not perpetrator of interactions. Much easier lives for both us, prescribers, and for the patients. But what we need to be very much switched on is that co-medications can affect the concentrations of the antiretroviral. So, Bictagravir, doravirin are metabolized by cytokine P453A4. Raltegravir, dolutegravir are metabolized by glucuronidation. If I give a drug that is inducing this metabolic pathway, my antiretrovirals will be decreased and therefore 
the patient is at risk. Low concentrations, virological replication in the presence of suboptimal concentrations of the drug, virological failure with resistance. It's not as frequent. You know, drug-drug interactions were a big deal when we had everybody on ritonavir, everybody on efavirenz. It's not as frequent, but we need to know about it because if we miss it, we can actually really cause problems because of resistance. Um, you were talking about rifampicin and dolutegravir. This is a typical example where rifampicin is the co-medication, is an inducer of glucuronidation and cytochrome P453A4. So it is actually the perpetrator of the interactions. Your co-medication either cannot be given with rifampicin or needs to be doubled up, like dolutegravir to 50 milligrams twice a day. So that, that's a typical example. Um, so I think uh, it's important to just have uh, some basic rules to manage drug-drug interactions. So the first question is, is my patient on other medicinal products, on other drugs? Do these medications have potential interactions with antiretrovirals? If yes, you can check the Liverpool website. In case of significant interactions, can the concomitant medication be discontinued? So I'm going to show you an example in a minute about certain supplements. Can they stop them because we are worried about them, for example? A, a typical example, um, I don't know how popular it is. Um, here, but it's St. John's Worth, which is uh, an antidepressant that is bought over the counter, like a herbal remedy. It's an inducer of cytokine P453A4 and glucuronidation. So it's very, very contraindicated with any antiretroviral. So that's obviously, if someone would be, was on that, you would tell them to stop it. That's an, an example. Can the dose of the concomitant medication be reduced or increased? Rifampicin, typical example, you double up dolutegravir to twice a day. Can an alternative concomitant medication be used? So imagine you are looking after someone with HIV, a lot of resistance on a boosted PI. You wouldn't use rifampicin, you would use rifabutin if you really can't do anything about their antiretroviral combination. So that's something obviously to be taken into consideration, can increase monitoring of adverse events and concomitant medication drug levels can be done. This is very important. We do give amlodipine to people on boosters. We do give fentanyl patches to people with chronic pain and on ritonavir, and we say just watch, see how you are, see if you can tolerate this, and we try like that. So monitoring adverse events can just by its own be an implementation around a drug-drug interaction or can an alternative antiretroviral be used to avoid the drug interactions. Obviously what we do, we have a multidisciplinary team, we call it virtual clinic, and if none of these are possible, we would refer to the virtual clinic that discusses complex clinical scenarios and supports clinicians in their practice. Now, this is a, an example of a what I describe as a possible older interactions. Now, again, we still see them. I mentioned it in my previous talk, actually. So this is a case of a iatrogenic adrenal suppression after co-administration of cobicistat with fluticas on nasal drops. So as you know, steroids are um, substrates of cytokine P453A4. So when you co-administer them with ritonavir and cobicistat, they are increased. And this is true even when you use them as nasal spray, nasal drops, ear drops, eye drops. So this is really important. And you do see people in clinic with iatrogenic cushionoid. So this is again the antiretrovirals that is a perpetrator of the interaction. This is, this graph shows you the concentrations of elvitegravir when it's given alone and when it's given with antacidate with high doses of cations like aluminum and magnesium. And this is the co-medication, which is the antacid, 
that is a perpetrator of the interaction, this time at the level of absorption, because it binds to the integrase inhibitors, it chelates it, and it's not absorbed. So uh, the patient who takes together without food your stribule of gemvoia with the antacids will not have enough elvitegravir in the systemic circulations to achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load and they will fail treatment. Again, the communication causing the interactions and the low uh, concentrations of the antiretroviral. Now, as I said, antiretroviral regimens have improved over the years remarkably. And with what we have today, it's really worth to talk about genetic barrier for a moment. Laura mentioned it in her resistant talk. And I'm going to talk about the inhibitory quotient. Now, if you're as old as me, the inhibitory quotient is something that is very exciting and very cool. Um, but... Um, it hasn't really been, been used very much um, recently, but in the older days, it was a very important concept and it was the relationship between the concentration and how much drug you actually need to overcome the replication of a resistant virus or a, a wild type virus. So it's the distance between the CTRAF and the target concentration that you need, the MEC, the minimum effective concentration. So, so in the older days, when we had drugs with the low genetic barriers that we could boost, we could boost, we were really measuring it to understand what those adjust when we needed to do to overcome the replication of a resistant virus. Nowadays, we have drugs like dolutagravir and bictagravir that are unboosted and have a very high inhibitory quotient. This is not really pharmacology, but when we talk about genetic barrier, we have to very briefly mention the, viral, the, the pharmacodynamics around the genetic barrier. So in the registrational trials for dolutagravir, bictagravir, we have seen that very, very few people fail, and when they fail, they fail without resistance. And this is why we say they have a genetic, high genetic barrier. And the pharmacological aspects, because the genetic barrier is many things, the pharmacological aspects behind the genetic barrier is having a high inhibitory quotient. Well, that is one of the reasons why they fail without resistance, or they don't fail, they fail very rarely. And this is the Emax curve. I'm very sorry to take you very much into pharmacology, but this is actually quite straightforward. Is the concentrations effectiveness uh, curve for dolutegravir, and it was uh, measured at the beginning when the drug was developed. And what you can see here is that at the end of the flat area of the red curve, where, where the cross is, that is where the majority of people that you see in clinic have, uh, those are where the concentrations of dolutegravir are. Can you see that before that area, there's a lot of flat, which means that even if you have 70% lower concentrations than the cross, you still have enough drug there. That means that a lot of drug interactions that lower the drug a bit are not clinically significant. There's a lot of room there. And that's why dolutegravir has a high IQ and a high genetic barrier. Now, when you cross the 70%, which is when you give it with rifampicin, it's too, much, too low, and therefore you need to give it twice a day. I just wanted to go backwards and make you think how us pharmacology thinks when a drug becomes available or even in the middle of the development, because then you see us being incredibly confident in using it or not, or using it in certain scenarios. It all starts from there. And this one is another example. So this is uh, the concentrations of Bictegravir uh, within Bictarvi. 
In the blue bit, blue-green bit, it's the high IQ. Can you see that all the patients in the studies had very high levels compared to your target, your EC95? That means that big tiger is characterized by a high IQ, high distance between, between concentrations and your target. But when you give it with rifampicin, you can see that the IQ is remarkably decreased, yeah? To the point that some people, can you see the square area, are, do I have actually a pointer? Oh, sorry, I have a pointer. You can see there, these people have low concentration. At the moment, this is why we don't give Bictagravir with rifampicin. Now, this is PK. Sometimes we need pharmacodynamics data to confirm that the PK is actually right and we can't give it. So in the ideal world, you want to try test Bictagravir in people living with HIV and TB together with rifampicin. And there is a study now happening in sub-Saharan Africa. But from a PK point of view, that's why we're cautious. That's all we have today. The IQ of Bictagravir in the presence of rifampicin is remarkably decreased, so we don't give it together. Now, a few words on long-acting, because obviously when we think about pharmacology, it's really important we understand the pharmacology be behind this very important new tool. So you can see that if you take your pills every day orally, the concentrations are look like that. They go up and down every day. But if you take a long-acting drug, such as an injectable, the concentrations look like the single blue curve. So concentrations over time, the concept, the pharmacological concepts of wanting concentrations above the minimum effective concentrations and not too high to be toxic are the same. It's just that you don't need a lot of doses over one month, over two months. You just need one administration and that's how the concentrations look. And uh, at Glasgow, they presented the updated multivariable analysis, uh, which uh, underlined the importance of uh, having uh, two or more baseline factors, such as resistance uh, to NNRTI, uh, such as uh, BMI and uh, um, CLADE A1A6. Uh, being factors associated to a higher risk of confirmed virological failure. And uh, also they show data about uh, having low concentrations of cabotegram repivirin at week 44. Obviously, having low concentrations was associated to virological failure. This is almost stating the obvious, right? But what I think it's important is that I, I think the injectables are a wonderful new a tool, therapeutic tool that are filling in a gap, uh, especially for people who cannot take pills or choose not to take pills, but uh, they are still not perfect. And we need to be uh, sure that when we administer the injections, it goes into the muscular mass because that is where the drug depot is formed and where the drug is released for two months. And uh, a very small number of people, but some people do not seem to achieve therapeutic concentrations for the two months regularly, and we're trying to understand why that's the case. It's a very minority, but just to underline that pharmacological considerations in this context are very important, but also patient's characteristics are very important. and. Um, I was talking uh, briefly about our experience in London. For everybody who wants to start injectables, we actually sit down at our MDT and discuss it in length. We make sure they don't have hepatitis B. We make sure they're undetectable. We do look at the MVA criteria very carefully. Laura mentioned about baseline resistant tests and NNRTI resistance. We are very careful about that because we don't want them to, uh, we don't want to put them at risk of failure. But obviously, if they uh, have a, um, a benefit from the injectables, we, we, we give it to them. 
Very briefly, other important characteristics when drugs become available and we start to know them from a pharmacological point of view is to look at intrinsic and extrinsic factors that can affect the concentrations of the drug. These slides is a sub-study from the lenacapravir study. Lenacapravir is a long-acting capsid inhibitor um, that is given subcutaneously every six months, so very exciting uh, injectables. And you can see that they looked at uh, age, weight, whether people were antiretroviral naive or experienced, uh, sex combined with other drugs. None of these factors impacted, affected the concentrations of lenacapravir, which is great, good to know we can move on with the development of the drug. And then very briefly, uh, one last minute on adverse events. And just a couple of uh, um, quotes about really adverse events, because obviously they're very much around pharmacology. And when you uh, have to do with deal with drugs, you always see adverse events. We have adverse events reported by clinical trials that, are for, of course, are the high quality, robust evidence. But let's not forget about the importance of real world data in really understanding um, what the population's experience is. And this is just an example. Clinical trials, discontinuation rates because of adverse events are very different than real world data because of adverse events. So for example, here you can see that in the registrational trials for Bictarvi, the discontinuation rate for Bictarvi was either 0% or 2%. Discontinuation rates for Dolutegravir plus NRTIs was 2%. But from real world data, bro both from the um, Big Star study or the German cohort, uh, real world data discontinuation was 6%. So just to say, you know, let's be very switched on about side effects uh, and discuss them with patients and make sure they are aware of it. And then if they come back with side effects, we know that if the clinical trial says 1% in the real world, it's probably higher. This was true also for injection site reactions with injectables. Um, the clinical trials reported this continuation rates because of ISR of 2%, and then the Carlos study, which was a real-world cohort in Germany, uh, was uh, uh, also a discontinuation rate that was a little bit higher. Uh, than, than clinical trials. So in conclusion, when you use drugs, it's all about pharmacological aspects. That's common sense. Some are worth highlighting and knowing. And uh, obviously, uh, we are doing all of this still to make sure we improve quality of life, right? How can I implement my pharmacology knowledge, my clinical knowledge, to improve equitable care, uh, to ensure equitable care and improve quality of life? And then I'm very sorry but every drug is a bit different. So although I try to uh, explain some overall concepts, we always have to go back to the summary of product characteristics and learn about each single drug. Thank you very much for your attention.